The study for tonight, instrumental music, why not? Instrumental music, why not? The first time I ever visited a building owned by Churches of Christ was in my home county in 1949. There was a young lady that I especially liked to be with who was a member of that congregation. I had grown up among the Baptists in my area and this young lady and I decided that we would, uh, I guess you'd call it court, I don't know what you call it now. I've been out of it 43 years, you lose a lot in the years. But in any case, I decided I'd go to church with her. And so I came to the building, and that was the strangest thing to me. They did not have a piano or an organ. And that just did not uh, seem right to me. I was impressed by two things among those folk. One of them, the knowledge they apparently had of the Bible. Till this day, I recall they were studying in the book of Matthew, and they were studying the 17th chapter of that book. And the teacher asked these folk to cite the contents of chapter 1, 2, 3, right on until the 17th chapter. And they were able there out of memory to recite the content of those particular books. And that impressed me greatly. I also was impressed, though not all that pleasantly at the time, by their lack of instrumental music in worship. Well, among other questions that I asked about the service, I found out very vigorously why they didn't have them. And I must say that uh, the explanation was delivered with such vim and vigor that I just didn't want to hear it. Well, not because of that, but uh, for a number of other things. Uh, we decided to go our separate ways after several months. And the next girl that I invited to go somewhere with me turned out to also be a member of the Church of Christ. <laughs> there I am again. What's happening here? But she was a very, very different person, and particularly her mother. Her mother was a remarkably fine woman, and she had a gentle but firm way of explaining what had to do with Christ and the church. And over the weeks that passed, I went to church where Brother Gus Nichols preached. And from time to time, he would discuss these matters. And as the weeks and months went by, I continued to study. And finally, I was baptized into Christ on July the 29th, 1950. Well, all of that, I think, has to do with this point. I know the strangeness of the refusal to use instrumental music. Why is that? Why do you folks not do that? Well, some say it's because we want to be stubborn, want to be different, want to be uh, somewhat contentious. And that's the reason. Well, I don't know that we're any more stubborn than anybody else. I met a few folks in other states that were a little bit stubborn in the church. And there might be a few that came in from Minnesota somewhere in California. I don't know. But if that's the reason, that's not a good reason. We ought not to object to something just because we want to be different, just because we want to be contrary and contentious. That's not a good reason at all. Others say the reason is we want to go back to the old frontier days in the early history of this country. That the churches of Christ never really understood that the frontier is gone. And though they drive cars and have air conditioned buildings and all of the other things, in their minds they've never gotten any further in religion than the horse and buggy days and that's why they don't use instrumental music. 
Well, if that's the reason, that's not a good reason. That's not a good reason to do anything. And then, of course, there are others who say that uh, we just don't know good music. I used to say, I guess as many of us listen to country music as any other group, but I do know that there are people among us who have excellent educations in music. They have been trained in some of the best conservatories and graduate schools in this nation. And they know the intricate matters of music and harmony as well as anybody. And they are teaching and training students in matters of voice and music and harmony. And granted, I'm not the world's best singer. But we have among us men and women who are knowledgeable in all aspects of music. And if the idea is we don't use instrumental music because we don't know good music, that's not a reason. If there is a reason, it must have a biblical basis. And so I want to think with you tonight about why it is that instrumental music is not used. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 8 and verse 20, the statement is to the law and to the testimony. If any speak not according to this law, it is because there is no light in them. Whatever the reason then, or reasons may be, they must arise from the nature and teaching of God's Word. And let me then suggest to you tonight, what I maintain is a Bible-based reason for not using instrumental music in worship. Let me begin by what I call a principle. Now, a principle is a statement of truth which is always applicable. Let me illustrate that. When I was a young teenager, I worked with my father, who was a carpenter. And when they were starting a house in those days, they made use of what were called batter boards. I don't know whether they still use them or called them that. But in order to get the building squared up, there would always be the moment when whoever was in charge of that crew would be sure that each corner of the strings would be exactly square. And there my father introduced me to what he called the rule of three, four, and five. And he illustrated it by holding the framing square and measuring out three inches and four inches and then across it was five. Now later on in uh, geometry and other studies I learned the uh, legs of the triangle and the hypotenuse and all of that big uh, statement. But in his way he knew that if you measure three and four and it's 90 degrees, it'll be five across. Always will be. Now that's a principle. Now a principle is a statement of truth that will always be applicable. I maintain there is a principle of truth in Scripture that has to do with this matter of instrumental music and many other things. Let me state that principle. When God has told us what to do and how to do it, we are obliged to do what God said in the way God said do it. Now let's think about that again. When God has told us what to do and how to do it, we are obliged by the authority of God to do what he said and do it in the way he said. Now that's a principle. And I maintain that if you will check that principle from the Old to the New Testament, you will find that it is always operative. Now let me illustrate. 
In the book of Genesis chapter 6, there is the account of the wickedness that had come in the world in the days of Noah. Indeed, the thoughts and the intents of the heart of the people was set on evil, and that continually. God determined that he would destroy the world. The exception would be those that would hear the preaching of Noah, a preacher of righteousness. God instructed Noah in Genesis 6 and 14, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in it, and thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Now think about that statement. First, he was to make an ark. I do not know the exact design of that ark. I've seen a few artist representations that may or may not be accurate. But Noah knew. Now the ark was to be made of what is called gopher wood. I don't know what kind of wood that was. But uh, I'm sure that Noah did. And when he made the ark, if he followed the way of God, he would make it of that wood. And then he was to make rooms in it. Not just one big room, but rooms. How many? The Bible doesn't tell us. But he had to have more than one. And then he was to pitch it within and without with pitch. I think of something like caulking, maybe tar. And it had to be inside and outside. Well, Noah could have said, well, and that doesn't make any sense to me. Looks to me like if I put it on the outside, the water can't get to the inside. And there's no sense in doing it on the outside and the inside. I'll just do it on the outside. No, God said do it inside and outside. Well, if I put it on the inside, if water comes from the outside, it can only get so far, and there's no sense putting it on the outside. And you know, he could have gotten to figuring that way, and he would have neglected to do what God told him to do. He said, you put it on the inside and the outside. Well, why? Well, my mother used to say, you don't ask me why. You just go ahead and do it. Well, maybe that's not an exactly good way to do things, but sometimes that's a pretty good thing to know. And especially when God is instructing. Now, verse 22 says, According to all that God commanded him, so did he. That's a high compliment. Now, notice what's happening here. He not only is making an ark, he is making it of gopher wood. He is putting the pitch within and without, and he is making the rooms in it, and he does as God instructed him. What's the principle? The principle is he's doing what God said in the way that God said to do it. Take another example. In the book of Numbers, chapter 19, there is the interesting account of what is called the water of separation. The Jewish nation at the time of Moses did not know what we know now of germs and communicable diseases and so on. But they did know what we now speak of as a quarantine. If a person, for example, developed some kind of sore on the body, and that sore got to a certain stage, and there was an inspection by one of the priests, it would be told to the individual, now you need to separate from the camp. You stay away from them for a while. Because whatever it is you have, we want to isolate you so you won't give it to the rest of the people. And so there the individual would be a safe distance away from the group, and when uh, the person had had several days to heal, there would be a priest come and check the particular illness. Well, no, you, you're not well enough yet. You'll have to stay a while longer. 
But the time would come when that person was well and could come back to the nation. But before that happened, there had to be use of what was called a water of separation. And that water of separation had to be made according to the instructions God gave. There was to be the burning of a red heifer. And the ashes of that heifer were to be put in a basin that was to be mixed with running water. And then the priest was to take a hyssop branch and sprinkle that water of purification on the individual who was now cleansed from the illness and he would be permitted to come back into the camp. Well, why not use a cow? Why not use a bull? Why not use a black heifer? Why not use a goat? Well, that's not the way God said to do it. Well, what difference does it make whether it is a heifer or a goat? I don't see any sense to that. And I can't see any sense to this ashes of a red heifer versus a black heifer. I can't tell any difference. Well, now, this is what God said to do. Doesn't make any difference to me whether you use his branch or something else does to God. And if you're going to do God's will, you will do as God said. What's the principle? The one we're talking about. Take the Lord's Supper. Years ago, I was in a school Union University and I had to take a course in what was called Christian doctrine which was really Baptist doctrine we had a lot of fun in that class we came to the subject of baptism one day and the teacher in the class said well of course in the New Testament Baptism was always connected with salvation. And everybody that was saved in the New Testament period was saved in being baptized. But he said, today we don't have to do like that. Well, I thought that's strange to me. A few days later, we came to the subject of the Lord's Supper, as he called it, the other sacrament. And he said, then taking that, we need to use bread and the fruit of the vine. And uh, maybe I shouldn't have, but I stuck up my hand and asked a question. I said, Dr. Briggs, why do you say that we must have bread and the fruit of the vine? Well, he said, that's what the Bible teaches. Well, I said, a few days ago, we were talking about baptism. And you said that though the Bible teaches that persons being saved in the first century were saved in being baptized, we don't have to do that. Why do we not have, why can we not do that but have to do this? He said, that's what's wrong with you, Woodson. You're always getting off the subject. <laughs> well, I talked to him after class about that. And he said, well, I knew you'd ask that question. But he said, the real problem is you think we have to do like the New Testament says. And I don't think we do. And that's the difference. Well, that hit the nail on the head. Now, the principle he could see with reference to the Lord's Supper. But he wouldn't admit it with reference to baptism. You see the problem here? Some years ago, I at Freed Hardeman received a young man in my office who was from the Christian church. He had come from, if I remember correctly, Indiana. And he wanted to talk to various of us in Freed Hardeman and elsewhere. And he talked with me about the matter of instrumental music, or wanted to. And I said, well, I'm glad to talk about it, but I want to ask you a question. What is it? Well, I said, when you people take the Lord's Supper, what do you use? Well, he said, bread and the fruit of the vine. 
Well, I said, why don't you use chocolate pie and milk? Well, he said, we don't do that. Oh, I know you don't. But why don't you? Four hours later, nobody upset, nobody mad. He wanted to talk about instrumental music. I want to talk about chocolate pie. By that time, I was getting kind of hungry. And after four hours, and we'd left my office, locked it up, we were outside on the campus talking, and I said, now this, it's time for me to go home. But I said, son, I have asked you for four hours about this chocolate pie and milk. And I know that you wouldn't use that. But I cannot get you to tell me why. And I think I know. The reason you won't tell me about the chocolate pie and milk is when you do. That's exactly why I don't use instrumental music. And I said, I have no more time to talk about this, and there's no point in talking about it any further. You understand, and I understand the same principle. I embrace the principle both with reference to the Lord's Supper and instrumental music, and you accept it with one and reject it with the other. And that's the problem between us. Well, I've never seen a young man since. I don't know what impact it had on him. But I think that's a very important thing to think about. Would it be proper to use hamburgers and Coke to take the Lord's Supper? Oh, we'd never do that, I know, but why? Why would you not do that? Got anything against hamburgers? No. Anything against Coca-Cola? No. Well, why not use it then for the Lord's Supper? Well, there may be somebody that's doing it, but I don't believe there are many folks that'll do that. And the reason they would draw back from that is the principle we're talking about. So here's that principle again. We do what God said in the way that God said to do it. And that is a principle throughout the entire Old and New Testament. Now, let's make application of that. There are only two kinds of music that can be offered. One is mechanical, and the other is vocal. The vocal is that which is offered by the human voice. Now, instrumental music may be of a thousand varieties, from beating sticks to playing organs, but you've still got an instrument other than the human voice. Now, those are the only kinds you have. And what did God say we ought to use in the worship of the church. Well, the passage that speaks most clearly to it is Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now that passage has been talked about and discussed in all sorts of ways. And if the time were appropriate, we could spend a great deal of time discussing the details thereof. But when we get down to the last detail, what we finally come to is that this passage instructed the Christians at Ephesus that when they worship God in song, they were to be singing and making melody in their heart to the Lord. And there are other passages that speak to that. Now what is the conclusion that we ought to draw from that? That we know that the singing of hymns, spiritual songs, and praise to God is right and true. And God has not told the church to offer mechanical, instrumental music 
in its worship. Now let me illustrate that by an account that I heard the late brother Floyd Decker present. Floyd Decker was an unusual man in so many ways. I knew him in Tupelo, Mississippi in uh, 1957, 58, and 59. Brother Decker was holding a meeting a little bit north of Tupelo at that time in a little town called Guntown. I don't know where they got that name. But anyway, that was the name of the little town, and he was there in a tent meeting. And one night he preached on instrumental music, and he told his story. Years later, in Bandana, Kentucky, I narrated the summary of the same event. And there were people in Bandana, just a few miles from Paducah, who were present when the event I'm about to describe occurred. And they said, we were there, and that's exactly the way it was. Well, I didn't doubt it when Decker told it. But it was interesting to me that it was confirmed by folks even uh, years later and after his death. Well, here's the story. Decker said when uh, he was living in uh, Paducah, Kentucky, we're talking 1926-27 now, that he was the preacher for the Merle Boulevard Christian Church. And in that Christian church, there was a fine woman who was neighbors and friends with a woman who was a member of the Church of Christ where T.C. Wilcox preached. And as neighbors sometimes do, they talked about many things and finally began talking about church. And they finally got around to talking about different subjects. And from time to time, when one or the other had asked a question the other couldn't answer, the person would go to one of the preachers and talk about it, and they'd talk back and forth. Well, finally they got around instrumental music. And Brother Decker said that uh, questions would come up, and the lady from the Church of Christ would ask the woman in the Christian church a question. She'd come over to Decker and go back and back and forth and back and forth. And finally he said, I got tired of that. And so he said, I told her, why don't you tell that lady that she needs to talk to her preacher. And that preacher needs to be willing to uphold what he believes. He doesn't believe you ought to use instrumental music. We do. And if he has any convictions and courage about him, then he'll agree to discuss this matter with me. Well, she carried the information over there. And T.C. Wilcox said, fine, when do you want to start? How long do you want to talk about it? Well, they negotiated a six-night discussion. Six nights. And Brother Decker was the first speaker. And he said he got up and he quoted Old Testament verses and he did this and that and on and on, 30 minutes. And then he said, Wilcox got up and he said the following. Went to one side of the board and wrote the word sing on it. Went to the other side of the board and wrote the word play on it. Now he said the Bible says, and he quoted the passage, Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, etc. And he said that's what we do. We sing. The Bible teaches the church to sing, that's what we do. Now he said, that's what you do, Brother Decker. And then drew a circle and he said, now write the verse in the New Testament that teaches the church to play an instrument in the worship of God. Sat down, two minutes. Well, Brother Decker said, I got up and I told him how silly he was and how awful it was and embarrassing it was and how he had failed miserably and on and on and on. But he said, I never did pick up the chalk. Well, when the 30 minutes was up, Wilcox got right back up and he said, well, he must not have understood. Decker said, I did understand, but I didn't want them to know that. So he went right back over it. Here's the word sing, here's the word play, this is what we do, this is what y'all do. Here are the verses, where's your verse? Sat down again. Well, 
the audience was dismissed. Now, I don't know whether they do it out here in uh, California or not. But when elders do this way with preachers, it's not fun. <laughs> well, Decker said that's what they did. Carried him down the basement. And the elders of the Christian church said, Brother Decker, we're very disappointed in you. Very embarrassed about this. And he said, what do you mean? Well, they said, he, he wanted you to put that verse up there and you didn't do it. And he said, well, I'd be glad to if you'd tell me where it is. <laughs> and they said, there's not one? He said, there's not one. And they said, what are you going to do? And he said, I don't know, but I've got five more nights of this. <laughs> Well, Decker said he went through that same thing Monday night, on Tuesday night, on Wednesday night. And he said, bless his heart, old Wilcox had one thing to say, and before he got through, even a child could have made the argument. And Decker said, along about Thursday night, it began to dawn on me. It began to dawn on me what's happening here. We're not just carrying on an exchange of ideas. We're not trying to best one another. What is really happening is, this man is probing my heart. And he is obliging me to admit, if not in actual words, that I cannot justify by the word of God what I'm doing in worship. I can't do that. And I know that, and he knows that, and everybody there knows it. And then he said, this is not a struggle with T.C. Wilcox. This is a struggle between me and God. And Decker said, I knew then I never could get over this problem. And he said, I tried every way I could to be cute the rest of the debate. But deep down inside, he couldn't get the point out of his mind. The debate ended. Time went on. And then he said, I approached the elders of that Christian church. And I said, brethren, I can't go on like this. I can't keep preaching like I've been doing. And they said, what do you mean? He said, I know now that instrumental music is not right. And they said, you'll never preach here again. You're out of here. And Brother Decker went down to the building where Wilcox was the preacher. And he said, I'm sorry. I've been wrong. And I want to spend the rest of my life serving God as he has taught me to do. Well, I heard that from Brother Decker. And I thought that is a wonderful thing to think about. And I believe that capsuled in that little story is this whole matter. Deep down inside, the matter of the use or non-use of instrumental music has to do with the principle of whether one is willing to abide by the teaching of God or not in worship. As was done so many years ago, the church can find easily passages that teach us to sing in the worship of God. But there's not a person alive that can find a text in the scripture that teaches the church today to use instrumental music in the worship. I'm well aware of the argumentation that's been given to attempt that. But when it has all been heard, the text is still not available. And then we come back to this point. Will we follow what God has taught us to do or will we not? And once 
the decision is made to follow that which God has not taught us to do. We have left God behind at that moment. We have taken the first step that leads ultimately away from God. And there's no stopping it. We may not go as far as somebody else will. But that first step is a long and significant one. Because it is said with reference to God, I'm not going to do what you told me to do in the way you've taught me to do it. I will elevate my wishes and thoughts and desires to the level of your divine authority. And I will say, your authority does not matter enough to me to bring my wishes and thoughts under your revealed will. My friends, that principle has not changed. It was not invented by T.C. Wilcox. It was not invented by me. That principle was embedded in the Word of God by the mind of the Lord. And the individual that will recognize that principle and walk away from it and not submit to it is not just talking about instrumental music. That person is talking about every essence of the submitting of the heart and the soul to God. Because when I can say to God, I'm not going to listen to you on that point. I can say to God, I'm not going to listen to you on the next point. And down that road lies the loss of respect for God and the endangering of my soul. Churches of Christ then have committed themselves to doing what God said in the way that God said to do it. I am well aware that there are some who profess membership in the church who do not follow and are not willing to follow this principle. They are flying false colors. They are not following what makes the church of Christ what it is. I do not always have the solution of how to cope with the difficulties involved. But I do know that at rock bottom dead center, this is the truth of God. And that is why instrumental music is not used in worship. This principle then of doing what God has said to do in the way God said to do it is vital. I'm aware that time could be spent, and I'm not averse to it, in discussing all of the attempts that have been offered, and there are many, but none of them will stand fair and full examination. And so we're back to the question, Will I submit to the will of God because I want to do what God said in the way he said to do it? That applies in becoming a Christian. When the bottom of the page is reached, the individual who has heard the gospel, who has believed in Jesus Christ, repented of sins, made the good confession, and is determined to be baptized for the remission of sins, that person is acting on this very principle. That's what God said. And I am going in a true and genuine act of submission to God. Do what God has told me. That's what the worship is about. That's what the Christian life is about. That is the heartbeat of all that is distinctive about the people of God in this world. And to deny that on one topic or another is to destroy ultimately the very essence of what the people of God in this world today are all about. And so we come to the close of the study. 
Instrumental music in worship is not used because it is not authorized of God for the church in the New Testament. And when we commit ourselves to the authority of God, we do what he said in the way he said to do it. That is also how one becomes a Christian. And if you're here tonight and are not a member of the family of God, we would encourage you to come in a true and genuine faith that results in your repenting of sin, confessing your faith in the Son of God, and being buried with Christ in baptism that your sins may be forgiven and you may be added to the family of God. We invite you to come as we stand to sing.